Let's pray. Lord, that is our prayer. To have an eternal perspective that sees trials as friends, that sees time as short, that sees you as our treasure. That is what we want. As we open your word tonight, oh God, would you teach us? Would you teach us from a man deported to exile as a youth, faithful to you through all the years? May we learn from a proud Gentile king who did not end well. And may we learn from you all that you have for us in your word. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter five. And once again, we're in the middle of the Gentile section, the Aramaic section of Daniel, right smack dab in the middle where God humbles two Gentile kings. Nebuchadnezzar was humbled unto repentance and Belshazzar was humbled to assassination. We find ourselves in the life and times of Belshazzar, last king of Babylon, the mightiest empire the world had seen to date. Where will you be when the music stops, when God stops the party? What will you be doing? What will you be thinking? What grand accomplishments will you be contemplating when your heart beats last or when God stops time altogether? We were looking at Belshazzar last time we were together and We were looking at the stupidest party in human history. And perhaps some of you went after the sermon and looked up the word stupidest and found that yes, it is in the dictionary. Let's begin by reading, we'll read the whole chapter to begin with and then we'll pick up the story in verse 13 this evening. Here's God's word, Daniel chapter five. Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels, which Nebuchadnezzar had father has taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine, and they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler and his nobles were perplexed. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, Your father, the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge, and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king, The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now I've heard about you that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. 
Just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts for yourself, give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. O king, the most high God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed. Whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated. And whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind and his heart was made like that of beasts and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the most high God is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart even though you knew all this but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, do not hear, and do not understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Now this inscription that was written out, Mini, Mini, Tikal, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the message, Mini. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tikal, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Paris, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave orders, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. God stopped Belshazzar's party. God brought the Babylonian Empire to an end. We're going to see this evening the end of the Babylonian Empire, the end of Belshazzar's reign, and the end of this stupid party in three scenes. We're going to see first the panicked king's request. We're picking up our story in verse 13. Read with me again verse 13. Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? And you remember the scene from last time. The queen mother, that's not Belshazzar's wife. That is uh, a wife that has had some standing in the kingdom for some time. She was familiar with Nebuchadnezzar's court. She may have been Nebuchadnezzar's wife or a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. And she is exerting wisdom and some authority here in Belshazzar's court. And she reminds him that there was a certain exile from the Jews, a Daniel, who had given wisdom and interpretation of dreams to the king's court before him. And here, like all the scenes before, Belshazzar has reluctantly turned to the mouthpiece of the living God. It's kind of like that last resort. Okay, I guess I'll turn to God. After all of the resources are exhausted, after turning to all of his wise guys, after looking to every other option he has, he finally turns the matter over to God's prophet, Daniel. Verse 14, he says, I've heard about you that a spirit of the gods is in you and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. 
And notice that Belshazzar, like Nebuchadnezzar before him, is a pantheist who considers Daniel's God just merely one of the regional deities that can be turned to for help in times of trouble. He's exhausted his own resources, and he's tipping his hat to the God of Daniel. He says, verse 15, Now the wise men and the conjurers, literally the wise men, the conjurers, were brought in before me that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me. But they could not declare the interpretation of the message. I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Belshazzar's speech here to Daniel is telling. As we made our way through the book of Daniel, the courtly rhetoric is highly repetitive and fluffy. Every phrase gets repeated one after another, but here Belshazzar is only using about a third of the speech that he got from the queen mother previously in the chapter. And why is that? I just read it in a really boring way, and I'm not going to try to imitate how Belshazzar would have said this to Daniel. Do you remember from verse 6 that his loins went slack, that is likely he soiled his britches? that he was absolutely petrified. He went pale. He went white as a ghost. His nobles before him began to be terrified because he couldn't keep it together. He couldn't keep the empire together. He couldn't keep his emotions together. He couldn't keep his bowels together. And in front of everybody, he is embarrassed and petrified, and he is the leader of the world's largest empire. And what is he terrified about? Well, he's just thrown a raucous party, drunken revelry, and gross immorality, and insane blasphemy. He went farther than any of the other kings of Babylon had done. He, he retrieved the goblets, the utensils that had been taken out of the temple in Jerusalem. An act of superiority, one nation over another. Ah, our gods are stronger than your gods because we can take your gods' stuff. So the, the furniture and the implements from the temple were in the trophy room in Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar kept them in the trophy room. There was probably some superstition that kept kings from blaspheming the other gods. I mean, why go to an extraordinary amount of effort to offend some foreign deity? But Belshazzar had no such qualms. In his drunkenness, he called for those vessels and brought them in and toasted the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone with these utensils from Yahweh's house, taunting the living God. And he did so in the midst of the impending doom of his empire. The city of Babylon is surrounded by the armies of the Medes and the Persians. He believes he's in an impenetrable fortress, but he has waged war against the living God. This really is a height of folly. He's exposed the poverty of his own resources. His wise guys don't know anything. He has reluctantly turned to the mouthpiece of the living God and the prophet Daniel. And then his pride is still expressed in attempting to dispense trinkets for answers. Look, I'll make you third as powerful in the kingdom. I'll give you the purple red robe that only royalty is allowed to wear. I'll give you the gold necklace that no one is allowed to be seen with without the king's express permission. Daniel, you can have all of that stuff if you solve this tension. What is Belshazzar doing here? He still wants control of the situation. And he's willing to pay a relatively high price to get it, but he still views himself as in charge. This is a panicked king turning to last resorts for some sort of help in his time of need. We see secondly, beginning in verse 17, the seasoned prophet's response. Daniel at this point is about 80 years old. How does he respond to this situation? First of all, in verse 17, Daniel displays his loyalty. Daniel displays his loyalty. Look what he says. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. 
That's audacious. In the court of a tyrant, to be giving orders, to refuse generosity, to refuse the king's bargain. Now, this is bold. What is Daniel doing here? He's making clear that he will not be bribed. He will not give answers under some obligation. He's not going to be obligated to the king by flattery or by bribe attempts. His message will not be tampered with. Daniel can't be bought. It means that Daniel essentially is not a mercenary, but a mouthpiece. He's not on duty getting paid for services. He is beholden to the living God. And what God says Daniel must say, Daniel will say. Daniel is upholding here the office of prophet. He can only speak what God gives him to speak. And so after displaying his loyalty, he says, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. Not because the king is asked, not because the king is paying, but because Daniel belongs to Yahweh. Remember Daniel's name, God is my judge. This is Daniel's loyalty coming through. And next, Daniel preaches a sermon. Verses 18 to 23 are a highly pointed, personally applied sermon from the prophet in the king's court. And this is very bold. This is deadly business, speaking unrequested sermons in the court of a tyrant. Under most circumstances, he could probably get two words out and off with his head or into a den of lions or a blazing furnace of fire or some other such torture. Now, we've already read twice in this book that kings had in mind to tear people limb from limb. That seemed to be a favorite demise. Belshazzar did not ask for a sermon. What did Belshazzar want? He wanted relief. He wanted answers. He desperately wanted the mystery solved. That's not what God had in mind. And this happens often throughout the Old Testament when Israel is in trouble. Read the cycle of the judges and and, and they want to know how do we get out of this mess, this mess we've gotten ourselves into by our rebellion and our idolatry. And God sends prophets, so often in the Old Testament, with messages. No, 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 I don't need messages. I need a solution to my predicament. And God says, you need truth. Before I get you out of this mess, you need to understand who I am, and you need to understand who you are. And here, this message comes to Belshazzar. To get right thinking about God, personal humility before Him, these were far more important than solving the riddle. In fact, the unfolding of Daniel's sermon here is more important than the answering to what is meeny, 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 tekel, and farson. Daniel front loads his answer about the writing with a timely, personally indicting, prophetic message. And Daniel's sermon here is a good Puritan sermon. If you've read Puritan sermons, you know they always have two points. The first point, Baptist sermons, three points in a poem. Puritan sermons, two points, text expounded and text applied. And that's exactly what Daniel does here. Daniel expounds the message in verses 18 to 21, and then he applies it in verses 22 and 23 to Belshazzar. What is Daniel's text It is the life and times, the biography of Nebuchadnezzar. Notice in verse 18, the sermon starts, O king, literally in the Aramaic it is, you, O king, and then Daniel drops the you part, doesn't pick it up again until verse 22. But from the very beginning, this sermon is an indictment against Belshazzar, you, O king, and it just kind of sits there. And then Daniel goes on with this biography of Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 18. You, O king, the most high God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. 
Whomever he wished, he killed, and whomever he wished, he spared alive. Whomever he wished, he elevated, and whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind. His heart was made like that of beasts. His dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the most high God is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. This last sentence in verse 22 is the theme of the entire book of Daniel. And it finds itself right here in the middle of Daniel's prophetic message to Belshazzar. It begins with the biography of Nebuchadnezzar. God gave, God gave, God gave over and over again in this text. First of all, God gave Nebuchadnezzar kingdom and glory and honor and majesty. And you remember that Nebuchadnezzar's perspective on this was different than God's perspective. Remember Nebuchadnezzar walking on the roof of his palace saying, look what I've done. Is this not Babylon the great that I have constructed with my own hands? Never mind the slave labor, many of the people who died building all of his stuff for him. But he saw himself as the, the genius and the architect. And Nebuchadnezzar was that Renaissance emperor who went from military general and conqueror and establisher of the kingdom of Babylon. He made Babylon great again, and he turned his attention away from military enterprise to architecture, building the greatest city the world had yet known. With all of its artistry, with the hanging gardens, with the canals, with the giant buildings, with the gate of Ishtar that you can go see to this day in a museum in Germany, all of this stuff was magnificent. So magnificent that a hundred years after Nebuchadnezzar's time, current historians would visit and see it and write about it and say it was the best thing they had ever seen. Nebuchadnezzar was great. God reveals that God was the one responsible for it. God gave Nebuchadnezzar the kingdom. God gave Nebuchadnezzar the glory, the honor, and the majesty. God was the one who gave to Nebuchadnezzar peoples and tribes and nations and tongues fearing and trembling before him. And Nebuchadnezzar's so-called sovereignty was a limited sovereignty, a derived sovereignty. That is, his power came from God. Nebuchadnezzar was on a short leash. The God of Israel is truly the one in charge, and Nebuchadnezzar did not know him. Nebuchadnezzar believed he had power over death, power over life. He could give the thumbs up and thumbs down to who would die and who would live. He had the power to exalt, and the, uh, he had the power to humble there was a street named in Babylon, apparently by Nebuchadnezzar, that was indicating everybody who comes here will be humbled. Apparently by the greatness of Babylon and the greatness of Nebuchadnezzar. And the great irony of his life was that God humbled him. Verse 20 says he was proud, he was deposed, and then he was dishonored, unhonored. He had been honored, and then he was removed from his honor. When his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. He recognized instantly that Nebuchadnezzar's so-called sovereignty was not truly sovereignty. If it could be taken away, how sovereign was he? If his glory could be removed, how glorious was he? The honor he had was not due to anything intrinsic in him, but was due to the sovereign purposes of the God of Israel. And so God gave Nebuchadnezzar humiliation. He became a disassociated outcast. His reasoning was blunted, even beastly. God made a donkey out of him. There's a detail here looking back at Nebuchadnezzar's life that doesn't come up in the prophecy about what would happen to him. That his place, his domicile, his residence was with the wild donkeys of the field. This seems to indicate that 
Daniel was aware of Nebuchadnezzar's situation in the midst of his insanity. Daniel seemed to have a soft spot in his heart for this Gentile king. And it is possible that Daniel even saw after his caring, his being cared for while in the field. He ate like cattle and he was unkempt. Literally, his body was wetted by the dew of heaven. He was exposed to the elements all the time until Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. Verse 21, until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. And you saw the progression in Nebuchadnezzar's life of moving from a pantheist who didn't care about the God of Israel, who was convinced that his own God, Marduk, was clearly superior to Yahweh, the God of Israel, because his army beat their army. And he took their people captive. And what was Israel now? Nothing. And Nebuchadnezzar eventually began to put Yahweh on the shelf of his pantheon of deities because one of Yahweh's people could interpret dreams. Some sort of supernatural power. Okay, nobody can speak against Yahweh anymore. And Nebuchadnezzar's acknowledgement of Yahweh moved from rejection of Yahweh to include him in the pantheon and don't speak evil of him to pride, to humility, to a repentance that acknowledged Yahweh as the only true God. It's a remarkable transformation in his life. Nebuchadnezzar is an object lesson ought to have been an object lesson for this Belshazzar. Belshazzar was not his biological son. Belshazzar may or may not have been related to Nebuchadnezzar, but was his successor. It's possible he was a grandson through his mother's line. But he was a successor to Nebuchadnezzar, and he appealed to Nebuchadnezzar's name, demanding in court that Nebuchadnezzar be referred to as his father, and he referred to as Nebuchadnezzar's son. That is, he is riding the coattails of Nebuchadnezzar's greatness. He wants all the prestige, he wants all the power, all the sway, all the weightiness of Nebuchadnezzar without the accomplishments. He is a poser, and he is as arrogant as they come. Daniel turns his attention to Belshazzar in verses 22 and 23. This is the second half of the good Puritan sermon. The text has been the biography of Nebuchadnezzar's life expounded, and now it will be applied. In fact, in verses 22 and 23, there are 14 uses of some form of the word you. This is a very pointed, personal indictment. Yet you, his son, and you can hear that word son dripping with sarcasm. You aspire to Nebuchadnezzar's status, Belshazzar, but you're not like him. I knew Nebuchadnezzar, and you are no Nebuchadnezzar. You have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all of this. Belshazzar was old enough, and his light was likely a, a, a general, a high official during Nebuchadnezzar's time, he would have had access to the, to the court of the king. He would have had access to the information. Nebuchadnezzar's life would not have been unfamiliar to Belshazzar. Belshazzar knew all of this and did not humble his heart. Belshazzar rode the coattails of the greatness before him. It was Nebuchadnezzar that built the empire. Belshazzar's own father, Nabonidus assassinated his predecessor, and then was run out of Babylon city because of religious differences with the local priests. And Nabonidus installed his son Belshazzar as king in Babylon city to run it for him. But Belshazzar was never popular with the people. In fact, the Greek historians report that when Belshazzar was assassinated on this very night, the people of the city of Babylon were relieved when he was dead. But Belshazzar wanted to be thought of as great like Nebuchadnezzar. You cannot escape the comparison in Daniel's sermon. Belshazzar, at your best, you were not as great as Nebuchadnezzar in his outcast animal state insanity. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar was humbled before Yahweh. 
You wanted to be like Nebuchadnezzar, but the best part of Nebuchadnezzar, his humility before the living God, you never aspired to. Who is insane? Who is beastly in Daniel chapter 5? It is Belshazzar at the stupidest party in history. Verse 23, look again at this party. Daniel rehearses it for Belshazzar. You have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. The only time this phrase is used in all of the Old Testament. You lifted yourself above the God who owns all of the heavens. And they have brought the vessels of his house before you, before you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them and you've praised the gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways you have not glorified. This really is a, uh, the, the height of insanity. For Belshazzar to taunt the living God. For Belshazzar to be surrounded by enemy armies and engaged in a party of drunken revelry. This is self-exalting pride, self-indulgent blasphemy, brazen idolatry, and willful insanity. And it's all coming to an end. Look at his self-exalting pride. You lifted yourself above the Lord of heavens. Listen, anytime we express pride, we bring God down to lift ourselves up. That is just the reality. When we think more highly of ourselves than we're ought, we automatically have a wrong view of God and a wrong view of ourselves. And the self-indulgent blasphemy, look what the text says. You brought the vessels from his house. You and your lords, your wives and your concubines were drinking from them. This drunken immorality, taunting the living God with the very things that God had set aside for holy worship of his name. Now, this is like, Two kids playing catch with a grizzly bear cub and mama bear is in the brush. You just don't want to do this. And look at the brazen idolatry. While they're drinking from Yahweh's goblets, they are toasting gods. Gods that are nothings. Remember, we talked about this last time. They're praising the gods of materials, of Stuff, created stuff, created stuff that is inanimate, created stuff that is mined and shaped and chiseled and refined by humans, by sinful, finite humans. These idols are smaller and lesser than people, and the people are infinitesimally small compared to the true and living God, and yet these puny little people shape and form these idols and then worship them. What a tragedy. And we're not off the hook when we merely assign idolatry to these material objects. So he bows down to sticks and stones that he carved. But anytime we carve out philosophies and worldviews and ideologies and things that we love more than the one true God, money and power and relationships and stuff and health and comfort and all the rest, anything we elevate to the level of idolatry where we sin to get it or we sin if we don't have it. In our hearts, these things that compete for our affections with the peerless and living God. It's all material stuff. It, it's puny stuff. It's small stuff. They worshiped and served the created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. And notice what Daniel says about them. They don't see, they don't hear, they don't understand. And these Gods could not help Belshazzar solve the riddle on the wall. They couldn't do anything. They're nothings. They're vanities. They're emptinesses. And notice the willful insanity here. Daniel says, you did not glorify God. The God who has your breath and all your ways in his hand. 
It's the insanity of saying, there is no Yahweh, there is no Yahweh, there is no Yahweh. Take a deep breath, <gasps> that comes from Yahweh. And then repeat, there is no Yahweh, there is no Yahweh, there is no Yahweh. This is the tragedy of rejecting God. Whether you're Belshazzar or a self-professing atheist or of any religious stripe, the God of the Bible is not true. I'm going to pick something else while you're stealing oxygen from the God of the Bible, dependent on him for every step in your life. Your every heartbeat is his. And we employ these things. Belshazzar employed these things to blaspheme. Daniel ends his sermon here and then interprets the writing, beginning in verse 24. The hand, was, the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. What does Daniel say in verse 24? God sent the hand. The God of Israel sent the hand. The him here is the one who gave you every breath you've ever taken, the one who marked every step you've ever had in your every day of your life and provided every beat of your not-for-long-in-this-world heart. He sent the hand, and it wrote this. Meany, meany, tekel, and parson. Your text might say, you farson, that's, that's really two words. The first part of it is just the word and. So you've got four words, meany, meany, tekel, parson. Without God's intent behind these words, their meaning remained a mystery. It's possible it was written in some mysterious script uh, that only Daniel could read. It, it is possible it was written in Paleo-Hebrew script. The, the script that we read to read our Hebrew Bibles now is actually Aramaic letters. So if Daniel, or if the, the hand had written in ancient Hebrew, Jews would have been able to read it, but nobody else. That's a possibility. It's also possible that the, that the words were written in Aramaic letters, but were only given in consonants. If you pick up a Jewish newspaper today, it's all consonants, no vowels. You read your Hebrew Bible, and vowels have been added after the fact with little dots and dashes. But you basically get letters that are all, or words that are formed all of consonants. And if you were only reading those consonants, you could make any number of words out of some given consonants. If you, if you had the, the letters C and T, you don't know if that's cut or cat or cot, kite, cart, any number of things without context. And here you've got something like MN, MN, TKL, and PRS. Some have supposed that a reasonable guess by those present in the banquet hall, if you make these Aramaic letters and you try to spell out, what, what's a word, what can I fill in that makes these work? You, you would get something like mina, mina, shekel, and uh, paris, uh, which is a half shekel, a divided in two shekel. Uh, a mina was approximately 60 shekels in the day. And so you, you've got a, a big denomination of money and a big denomination of money repeated and then uh, one shekel and then half shekels. And even if you could sort of try to form words out of these letters and, and you came up with uh, uh, mina, mina, shekel, two half shekels, you're still left scratching your head. Well, what does that mean? And if somebody had just scribbled it on the wall, if it was some sort of graffiti in the banquet hall, you, you wouldn't think anything about these words. It, it has no meaning. But, but remember, a dismembered hand has written this on the wall supernaturally in the king's presence in front of the lampstand. And this wall was plastered white. The light was on it for all to see. This would have been terrifying. This is clearly supernatural, clearly meaningful. The, the meaning must be significant. And so Belshazzar called everybody he could to find out this mystery. And he is panic-stricken, terrified. 
He has been sobered by the reality that some supernatural event is happening in front of him while his city is surrounded. The, the rest of the empire's armies have been defeated and he has just blasphemed the living God. It, is that God now sending a message? The party has stopped. All eyes are on these four words. Verse 26, Daniel gives the interpretation. The interpretation has this message, meaning God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. This is uh, meaning, not mina, and it simply means numbered. God has numbered your kingdom, and he caused it to be complete. It's finished. It's over. And this one is said twice, numbered, numbered. God has numbered your kingdom, and it's over, Belshazzar. God has numbered your kingdom, and it's over. These are serious words, arresting words. There's no, it's over unless you, there's nothing like that. It's just over. The third word, tikkul. There is a compliment in Aramaic that, that is the word for shekel, um, and that can mean a denomination of money, but here it just simply means that which is weighed rather than a coin of some specific value. You are weighed on the scales, Belshazzar, and found deficient. You are lacking. And then Paris, P-R-S, it's the singular form of the word up above, farsen, um, and it simply means divided, cut in two. And the interpretation is there in verse 28. Your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. Uh-oh, is right. And accurate historically because the, the Medes and the Persians were a, a combined empire at this point and had formed combined armies. Interestingly, the, the P-R-S word, those three consonants together, are the same consonants used for the word Persian. What is the message on the wall? What is the writing on the wall in Belshazzar's palace? Numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. You're done. You're done. You are deficient and your kingdom is over. It's split up and it's given to others. Lights out on your party curtains for the mighty Babylonian empire. And this for Belshazzar was the last time to hear God's word in this life. We heard about it from John Anderson this morning, the parable of the soils. Having access to a clear proclamation of God's truth is no guarantee that you hear it unto faith with a softened heart, with a humble heart before the Lord, in a way that saves you from sin. Nebuchadnezzar had access to truth, and there was a turn of heart. Belshazzar had access to truth. And the next time you would hear God's voice, it would be in person. The final scene here is the doomed empire's collapse. Verse 29 to the end of the chapter. In verse 29, we see Daniel rewarded. Belshazzar gave orders. They clothed Daniel with the purple red. That is the, the purple red robe with the very rare dye that nobody could wear but the king. They put a necklace of gold around his neck. That is that chain and medallion that nobody could wear without the king's permission. And they issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, Daniel had told Belshazzar earlier, keep your gifts to yourself, give them to someone else. Here he accepts them. Daniel is not sold out, by the way. There's no reason to refuse them now. He has not been bought. His message has not been compromised. And perhaps Daniel knows that his newly acquired, really important government position is going to last about a couple of hours. And then Belshazzar is killed, verse 30. So sudden, so abrupt here. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. 
Chaldean was synonymous with Babylon, uh, with Babylonian, but kind of really special Babylonian. The Chaldeans were the southern Babylonians that really uh, became the Babylonian Empire and were the central hub of its culture and its greatness. And it is all over now. On October 12, 539 B.C., the Medo-Persian armies undid the great Babylonian Empire. This is one of the monumental events in world history. And it gets the mention of two verses here in Daniel chapter 5. How did the Medo-Persian armies breach the impenetrable fortress of the city of Babylon? You remember that outer wall that we talked about, 17 miles in length, 40 feet high with unbreachable gates. The top of the wall was so wide, in fact, that chariots uh, could pass each other on the top of the wall. Every section of the wall was guarded by battlements and armed guards and archers. Well, the Medo-Persian armies had engineered a rerouting of the Euphrates River. Remember that Babylon was set up as a fortress with some 40 years worth of food stores and the Euphrates River that brought fresh water in every day. They, they really could wait out any siege. Uh, but the engineers of the Medo-Persian army diverted the Euphrates River into a swampy lowland. And when the river was low enough for soldiers to wade in about thigh deep, elite troops sneaked in under the barriers that let the river through the city. They got under the gates and they went straight to the palace. They executed Belshazzar and those closest to him, all before most of the city knew there was even a hint of a breach. In fact, in some quarters of the city, Herodotus, the Greek historian, tells us the party kept on going and Babylon was no more before the Babylonians even knew it. This, of course, is a fulfillment of Isaiah 21 and Jeremiah 51, where God had prophesied this very thing. Cyrus, the head of the Persian Empire, and his armies of Medes and Persians were now the inheritors of the territory of the Babylonian Empire. In verse 31, we see Darius installed. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at the age of 62. We'll look at Darius in the weeks to come. There is no mention of Darius the Mede in secular history. There are mentions of men by other names, and we'll look into some of the options of the identity of Darius the Mede. It is a fascinating study, and again, another vindication of the historical veracity of the book of Daniel, who told the future again and again and again, and every time people who are skeptical about the Bible try to dismantle Daniel, Daniel wins. And we'll look at Darius in the weeks to come. I want to close with the words of Joseph Parker. He was an English pastor in the 1800s. And while his words are directed at preachers, I want to direct them to all of our hearts. I want to think for a few moments as we close about an implication for what it means to boldly proclaim God's truth in an unwelcome environment. Belshazzar didn't invite a preacher. He didn't invite a mouthpiece of Yahweh until he was desperate. And that's kind of the way parties go. Nobody wants a party pooper. Nobody wants a buzz kill. Nobody wants a truth teller when we're all here distracted and having fun. But you and I get into those environments sometimes. And sometimes we're called in as a last resort. If you know the truth and you're known for holding on to the truth and desperate times call for desperate measures, you may be called upon to speak. And what will you say? Here are Parker's words. Preachers of the word, you will be wanted someday by Belshazzar. You were not at the beginning of the feast, but you will be there before the banquet hall is closed. The king will not ask you to drink wine, but he will ask you to tell the secret of his pain and heal the malady of his heart. Abide your time. You're nobody now. Who cares for preachers, teachers, seers, men of insight, while the wine goes around and the feast is unfolding its tempting luxuries? Midway down the program, to mention pulpit or preacher or Bible would be to violate the harmony of the occasion. But the preacher 
as we have often had occasion to say, will have his opportunity. They will send for him when all other friends have failed. May he then come fearlessly, independently, asking only to be made a medium through which divine communications can be addressed to the listening trouble of the world. Daniel will take the scarlet and chain by and by, but not as a bribe. He will take the poor baubles of this dying Babylon and will use them to the advantage of the world through actions that shall become historical. But he will not first fill his hands with bribes and then read the king's riddles. The prophet is self-sustained by being divinely inspired. He needs no promise to enable him to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Indeed, he has nothing to say of himself. Every man, in proportion as he is a Daniel, has nothing to invent, nothing to conceive in his own intellect. He has no warrant or credential from the empty court of his own genius. He bears letters from heaven. He expresses the claims of God. O oh, Daniel, preacher, speaker, teacher, thunder out God's word. If it be a case of judgment and doom, or whisper it, or reign in gracious tears, if it be a message of sympathy and love and welcome. Let's pray. Lord, may we heed those words. May your words be ready on our lips to suit the occasion, to speak into the emptinesses of those chasing after vanities in this life around us those who would even blaspheme you, those who would revel in drunken parties, distractions, entertainments, anything to get them through the days and the months and the years of this life. God, would you bring sobriety and opportunities for the gospel, the saving work of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that message on our lips. And may we be faithful in those moments to go independent of any favors, independent of the fear of man, independent of any loyalty other than loyalty to you. And would you be pleased, as you were with Daniel, to make your truth clear? And God, would you be pleased further to humble our friends, our family members, our children, our neighbors? to bring them to saving faith in your son. And we ask it in his name.